John, we got a repeat guest again this week, someone we had on last season and uh, someone who was in the news recently because they uh, re-signed Cody Bellinger, and that's Chicago Cubs president of baseball operations, Jed Hoyer. Absolutely, and the Cubs are flying high. Obviously, the Bellinger deal uh, was hailed as a very good one. It certainly was key that, to bring him back to at least have a similar offense to what you had uh, last year. And, uh, you know, I think it's good timing, and thank you for getting Jed Hoyer, and Thank you, Jed Hoyer, for being a uh, repeat customer. We, we do appreciate those. Yeah, we'll ask him about all his key stuff that's going on there, what he thinks about the NL Central, Imanaga, who he signed out of Japan, uh, Jamison Tyon and his injury and more. John and I will talk about a key injury as much as we can, which is Garrett Cole and Aaron Judge and what it means for the Yankees and what the Yankees could do. We'll play hit and error at the end if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. John, we've uh, delayed, but we can't delay any more uh, doing the podcast this week. We were hoping that we'd have firm Garrett Cole news, what exactly the injury is, maybe even a little more on Aaron Judge. It's pretty clear that's the major news, not just in New York, but in baseball. Garrett Cole's arguably the best starting pitcher in the sport. He won the Cy Young Award in the American League last year. And the least we can say is it's not good. Uh, Aaron Boone has already pretty much declared he's not there for opening day. And I think if we could put the Yankees on truth serum, they'd probably say uh, if we could have them back middle of May, early June, that would probably be a victory from some of the early things you're 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 hearing out there. John, I wonder if we could just start in this place. Uh, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask people when I know they're kind of like full of it a little bit is I'm like, are you a liar or are you an idiot? Uh, like, which way would you like me to go with this? Like, this feels like the, every Yankee injury is are you dishonest or incompetent? Uh, the, the, you know, like Aaron Judge starts his body achiness, normal body achiness. There's nothing wrong with Oswald Peraza, really. He'll be back in a few days. Now it's two months. So it's, I, I, I mean, they needed to clean up the injury stuff. They probably have to clean up some stuff on honesty. Well, what's going on with this team? Yeah, I mean, this has been going on for quite a while with the injuries. Maybe, maybe they're, you know, looking on the positive side. Maybe they're just overly optimistic, uh, you know, I don't want to call them liars, but, uh, you know, these things turn out a lot worse than they originally say all the time. I do think they need to revamp their medical staff or processes because it's obviously a disaster. I mean, I don't think there's any two ways about it. Look what happened last year with Rizzo. I mean, I don't know. He got past it. He's doing well. I, I can't even fathom how this happened. I mean, when he was collided with Tatis, he was stumbling around. He clearly had a concussion. I could I could diagnose from the press box. And, you know, I mean, I know he's a tough guy. He wanted to be back. But uh, this was a big mistake to put him back on the field and then watch him be a shell of himself for six weeks. And John, then, if I could just jump in for one second yeah. to say this is is forget about diagnosing it from the press box, which is obvious. It looked like a knockout in a heavyweight fight. You know, we know what Anthony Rizzo looks like on the field. He stopped looking like that on the field. You have to know something more is going on, right? Like you're getting right. information every day that he doesn't look like Anthony Rizzo. Yeah, I mean, you can. You, I mean, guys who are uh, sluggers are often streaky. So you know, I could see that for two weeks, but not for six weeks for the guy to go on and not be able to see the ball. Um, you know, they're hopeful. They believe. They trust their players who tell them they're fine. Yeah, I, 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 I think they need to to figure out what's going on because uh, obviously last year injuries killed their season. Uh, some of them were flukes. I mean, Judge just being the great player and make trying to make a great attempt that was just bad luck. But I mean, now we're in spring training, and I know a lot of teams are suffering injuries. But this is a team now with a history of injury problems, and they've got to figure it out. Yeah, I think, John, you and I are old enough to remember when we were told Nick Johnson was going to miss two days with a wrist injury and he missed two seasons. So, you know, like a, it's many. not a, it's not the many. newest thing in the world with that. But if it feels more loaded the last few years where these initial reports are, you know, it's nothing but a scrape. And, you know, yeah. it's like a, it's like the Monty Python and the Holy Grail. They're missing two arms and bleeding out of stumps uh, after yeah. a while. I, I, think, I feel like they had suspicions on Cole earlier. Right. I mean, he wasn't really he was kind of pitching on the side. He didn't start with the throwing right away. And 
I, I don't know. I mean, I guess they're trying to be as hopeful as possible. They don't want to be overly dramatic, but uh, it, it turns out like that they look like liars a lot of the time. Yeah, it's not it's not a great look. And and look, it, all that would be easy to get over. You know, we we last year they had a, a year that their general manager called a disaster. A lot of that was built around judges freak injury to some degree Rizzo's freak injury it really took the uh, you know what was a questionable offense to start with it completely put it in the toilet again no way to sugarcoat it is any loss of judge for a period of time or any loss of Cole for a period of time is dramatic for for the Yankees uh look I I, I wrote this the other day I think good teams overcome things Max Fried started I think 11 or 12 games last year the, the Braves won 104 the whole Dodger staff the rotation missed a significant time. They won 100. DeGrom started six games. The Rangers won the World Series. You know, uh, the Rays lost their three best starters for significant times. They won 99 and made the playoffs. If you're a good team, you figure it out. And nevertheless, it's Garrett Cole. It's hard to overcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can be unlucky with injuries, but I mean, this is this has gone on too long. They're, they're also a top-heavy team, obviously. I am Judge, arguably the best position player in baseball, um, certainly in the league. Um, Cole, I think, unquestionably the best starting pitcher in baseball. Um, you know, I think they were made the favorite based on the fact that they've got a handful of spectacular players, throw Soto in the mix. You know, it's a little bit like the the Washington Nationals when they they actually did win the World Series when they were very top heavy with with Scherzer, Soto, Har uh, not Harper, but uh, the others. And uh, you know, this is a, an issue. Uh, the depth is is important, and uh, especially with a team that's older. And uh, things don't look great net right now. Uh, I was a little surprised that they were made the favorites to begin with, but I don't know if you got to see the Orioles at all. I, I didn't see what they did yesterday, but uh, they just run up the score on everybody. Their depth is incredible. Uh, you know, in spring training, obviously you're playing everybody and then bringing in the subs. And I mean, they just got player after player after player who can hit. And all these guys that you barely heard of, uh, Colby Mayo, Colton Kowser. Uh, it's not just Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in baseball, and obviously Gunnar Henderson and the others, but that team is fantastic, and it's young. It beat the Yankees by 19 games last year. And yet, I don't know, Las Vegas loves the Yankees, apparently, but uh, uh, right now, things don't look good for them. They probably use the same analytics the Yankees do to get top-heavy. The Yankees turned into an NBA team, right? Like, they're the Phoenix Suns. They have three great players, and then they hope to build in around it. It does put, like, pressure on, is Anthony Volpe going to take a step up? Is Austin Wells a good enough? You know, I'll, I'll say this. He, he, I think Austin Wells has caught well at the end of last season. Boone went out of his way to talk about how well Wells caught I was watching, I hardly ever watch spring training, certainly from home, but I'm home, but I wanted to watch the day the cold news broke. Austin Wells could not have caught a worse game than he caught in the game I was watching the other day. So, like, I need to still still see a, a lot more there. Look, I think it's somewhat survivable for the Yankees. It's certainly survivable. Rodon and Cortez and Stroman have each been an all-star in the last two seasons. If they're close to those guys, the Yankees can survive a month or two without Cole. You know, a lot of teams would take three All-Stars in their rotation without Cole. They don't have that good. A lot of weight is on those three guys. Yeah, well, Top Heavy works better in the NBA. You're more of an expert than I am. But, you, you know, you can win a championship if you've got Michael Jordan and Pippen, right? Or LeBron yep. by himself. You know, it doesn't work in, in MLB. It was rare that the Nats were able to do that. I wasn't saying I, it as a compliment in baseball, just so you know. No, absolutely not. <laughs> so, uh, you know, depth is a very, very big issue for them, I think. And, uh you know, I think they need to go out and do something now. It's not the easiest thing to go out and do right now. And I know if you're needing an outfielder, there's a lot of guys out there who are pretty good, who are going to get team-friendly deals, most likely. But to get a pitcher, I mean, you, your options are to pay Snell $30 million and then the $33 million tax, you know, compete with all the other teams with for Cease. And I think uh, I think the White Sox, you know, I, you hear a lot about Spencer Jones. I think they asked about Volpe at some point. You know, I, I don't blame the Yankees. You know, I mean, I don't blame them for asking. You can, it doesn't hurt to ask, but, um, you know, you can't trade your starting shortstop, obviously. And, you know, I don't, the Yankees don't want to trade Spencer Jones. And, you know, they have their 
belief that he's going to be a big star, and he may be. I mean, we saw that 470-foot home run right off the bat, no pun intended, first at bat. So uh, in spring training, you know, there aren't a lot of great options. I don't think you want to go to Clevenger. You know, there's Lorenzen, who wasn't great at the end of last year. Did throw, didn't throw? did he throw a no-hitter? I think so. But yeah. uh, not a lot, of, a ton of great options. It's unfortunate. Cease, if they can work it out for Cease and 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 obviously exclude Volpe and hopefully exclude Spencer Jones, that might work because Vol- Cease makes only $8 million this year and he's going to be on the team, whatever team he's on next year, contract contractually. So to me, that's the one that makes the most sense. Obviously, they said they were hell-bent. If you're hell-bent, who cares about the $30 million tax? Go get Snell, you know. To me, to me, they don't look like a championship team. I know they were all stars in the last th- two years, right? But I mean, Rodon, it was a year ago. Do you think he's going to be an all star this year? No, he, no, I didn't absolutely. like anything I I saw or heard out of Rodon when I was when I was in Yankee camp. After Rodon, he he faced the Rays. This was after he gave up four homers in an intra squad game. The first pitch he pit threw was hit for a homer, and the last pitch he threw was hit for a homer. And afterwards. I think I've been around long enough to know what whistling in the graveyard guys are. I, I, I'm wondering if people know what that expression still means. Whistling in the graveyard, you kind of whistle because you want to act like you're not afraid, but you are afraid. You know, like, look, we've for, for, for better or worse, Tom, we've been around guys who can absolutely handle big moments like Derek Jeter and Mariano Rivera. We know David Cohn, Orlando Hernandez, Adeki Metsuwe. We know what that looks like in New York. When Carlos Rodon's talking the other day to reporters, it sounds like he's trying to convince himself. That it's not bad what's going on. That that didn't sound great when I when I heard it. Uh look, you know, it, it you know, they're built on Cole, Soto, and Judge being healthy and great. They have three of the best 10 players in the sport. Every moment that's missed by those guys take away what their strength is, which is the opposite of the Orioles' strength, to your point, which is the Orioles will throw waves of depth, especially young athletic depth, at teams. Uh, the Yankees were going to brutalize teams by having three of the 10 best players and hoping their supporting cast is healthier. Rizzo, LeMayu, Stanton, and a grade better than last year. Wells, Volpe, et cetera. You know, without that, we might be looking at 82 wins again for all we know. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I hate to keep picking on Rodon, uh, who's turned out to be a, a very nice fellow, but I mean, you know, it looks like he's trying to revamp his repertoire, and that's not an easy thing to do. And, you know, I ran into a pitching guru over here, and I'm in Phoenix, and uh, yesterday, and talking about Rodon and, and pitchers like that, he said that they're stuffed guys. And, you know, if their stuff goes south a little bit, they really are not great pitchers in terms of the command and how to get guys out when you're throwing three or four miles an hour less you know, he, he said that Lester Sabathia was picking on two lefties who came up and were stuff guys and then were able to adjust and be great pitchers uh, and get guys out when they were throwing. In Sabathia's case, when it went down to 94, 95, Lester, when it went down to 89, 90, still able to get guys out. You know, Rodon is not that guy yet. He needs He's going to need to adjust because when he was in Chicago and San Francisco, he was throwing 100. You know, I mean... It's a little better this spring where they're saying he's throwing 94. I'm not just saying he's, I'm going to assume that. They're big, they're telling the truth about that. He's throwing 94, 95. Maybe his fastball's injured, and they're not being honest about his fastball being injured. I don't know. Well, you know, you know it might be just, you know, age. It might be an age yeah. factor. But uh, I think it's one of the reasons, you know, I think you just defined the reason Blake Snell uh, isn't signed to a long-term contract. I think people think of him as a stuff guy. By the way, when Dylan Cease gets out on the market, I think people think of him more as a stuff guy than as a crafty pitcher who kind of thinks it out and and does it along the way. Right. But he's very young. He's young, so he has time yeah. to figure it out. Once a guy gets into his 30s, you're, you're kind of thinking, can Rodon become that kind of guy? You know, Cease is a young pitcher, you know, and it's not unusual to rely on – he has great stuff. So it's not unusual at that point to rely on that great stuff. So I, I, I could see Cease adjusting pretty easily and, and – you know, obviously he didn't have a great year last year, which brings the price down a little bit. But, I mean, at this point, I don't blame the White Sox for asking for a ton. Who else yeah. is out there, you know, I, that you're going to get without paying a $33 million tax? And yeah, I he thought- was a number one type pitcher in 2022, and he's a young guy. It's not like, oh, Rodon was a number one pitcher in 2022, and he's 30. This is a guy who's in his mid-20s. 
Yeah, I think the White Sox were trying to time this out for when everybody was done with uh, the entire free agent top of the market, starting right. pitching Montgomery and Snell. They'd then be like, OK, here's the four teams that still need a starter and they're desperate. There's no place else to go. Of course, this whole offseason got messed up in that way because, you know, uh, we Man. still have Montgomery and Snell out there. Look, one there's of the so many pitching injuries. I mean, yeah. I, it's, I mean, every you know, little ones like Sonny Gray and. Taiwan Walker and you've got Jameson Tyone and you know it goes on and on and on and uh, obviously bigger ones like Cole although we don't know how big it is at this point but he's going to be out a little while for sure uh, you know so I think the injuries have probably raised the stakes for Cease yeah uh, you mentioned Jameson Tyon I mentioned Marcus Stroman they were both Cubs last year I'm sure we'll ask uh, the Cubs president of baseball operations Jed Hoyer about both of them if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayden. John and I are so thankful that during spring training, uh, Jed Hoyer, the president of baseball operations for the Chicago Cubs, joins us. Uh, Jed's in Arizona. John's in Arizona. I'm back in New York. I'll be down in Florida in two more days. Uh, Jed, I wonder if the place to start is you you did significant stuff this offseason, starting with uh, signing the largest manager contract in history with Craig Council, but retaining Bellinger, bringing in uh, I- Imanaga, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, trading for Michael Bush, signing Hector Norris. Uh, how close to your plan uh, was was this when the offseason began, hitting these areas with these players? Yeah, pretty close. I'd say that, you know, thinking about our offseason, um, you know, we, going back to Stroman opting out, we knew we needed to replace those innings. Uh, we knew we needed to add a, a veteran presence in the bullpen. And we knew we needed multiple left-handed bats. And so that was sort of the biggest focus. And, I mean, of course, I think if you're, you know, you're always wanting to do more, you know, in, until you, you know, sort of get to that final place, you always want to do more. But I feel like given our goals, we, we knew we needed to replace innings fix the bullpen and add bats. I think we, we were able to, to check those boxes. And then the council thing was, you know, um, an opportunity that presented itself that we felt like we just had to take. And um, it's been wonderful to be in, in camp with him and, you know, excited to sort of be in the first inning of a long relationship with him. I think he's a, both a great manager, but I also think he's a, a, a resource for us as well as we, as we try to build a championship team. You know, one of our favorites from New York was Jamison Tyone. And, uh, you know, obviously terrific pitcher when healthy. Uh, we understand he has a little bit of a back situation now. So I was wondering if you could update us on that. And also, are you at least looking at uh, – you made a lot of good moves already. But uh, are you looking at the free agent market at all for a pitcher? Yeah. Uh, so he had some back spasms when he was warming up the other day before he went in the game. Uh, the MRIs were um, you know, relatively clean. Um, I think he's certainly going to likely be slowed a little bit into the season would be my guess, but it doesn't seem too bad. And then, you know, as far as free agents, I mean, I generally think this is the, our team out there, we're always looking at trades, we're always looking at small things, but I think that'd be my general uh, impression would be that this is our group. Uh, just to, to follow up on that a little bit, uh, Jed, is you mentioned small things. You're one of the team's, that has been associated with J.D. Davis, who popped up on the market in the uh, last few days. Uh, you've been trying, I believe, Christopher Morrell at third base. You still have Patrick Wisdom. What What is your third base situation? And is Davis a guy you could imagine, if only small things are being done, does he fall into the category of small things? Well, without talking about J.D. in particular, you know, I think you know, right now Madrigal has been slowed a little bit by hamstring injury, but he played really well at third base last year. Um, Morrell is a guy who's he's a talented hitter as everyone knows we haven't really given him one position we're really trying to you know give him third base right now let him let him just like work at third and not move around and then obviously wisdom's played a lot of third so um unclear how that third base job shakes out candidly i think that that's going to be that's probably of all the positions on the field that's like the one that has the least certainty i think when you look at the rest of the diamond you kind of know who's playing where that's the one area i think is a little bit unclear so far and um we have a couple more weeks to figure that out. But my constant caveat in spring training, as you guys have done this for a long time, is that ultimately we can 
try to make decisions here, but it's going to come down to what happens in season, you know, as you know, how guys play over the length of uh, months or over 162. And so we're trying to learn right now about what guys can do, but ultimately it's going to come down to the season, I think. You know, when you're talking about small things, obviously you did a big, a couple, few big things, but the biggest thing was to bring back Cody Bellinger, who was fantastic for you. Signed him on a great deal around 17 million. The previous off season worked out fantastically. Obviously, uh, became himself again. Um, didn't win another MVP, but very good player. Uh, tell me how about those negotiations. I know they started way early in the offseason, and they just ended a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, my understanding, I heard from somebody who said that, you know, you and Scott Boris just got sick of talking to each other eventually and said, oh, we better get this done. How did you end it up? And, you know, I looked – it does look like a good – it's a good thing for the Cubs, certainly. But everybody looked yeah. at it as a big win. Still, you got – he might be going in a year or two years. So how do you look at it? Do you perceive it as the big win yeah. that other people are? Well, I mean, I think that these conversations really started last July. Um, you know, when when it, we were very unclear buyers or sellers at the deadline, we ended up winning a bunch of games in a row and becoming a buyer. But prior to that, we I had talked to Scott about deals to keep Cody – going going back he liked it here we liked having him so those conversations were just kind of were ongoing and to your point they went on for a long long time but i think it's a listen i think it's a good deal for both sides i do um you know he has a chance to make 30 million this year and, and opt out and become a free agent again um we get, get a chance to retain him you know and, and you know, bring him back and he's a big part of our team you know, he was our best offensive player last year He's super versatile. Uh, as a teammate, he's outstanding. So, I mean, it, it worked out really well. You know, he was a priority the whole offseason. I was glad it I'm glad it worked out for both sides. And I think it worked out in a, in a way that um, you know, both sides can, can really benefit, which is the whole point. You know, Jed, just to stick with Bellinger, because I found it so fascinating uh, in this marketplace. In a way, he was a story of modernity, right? We wouldn't have known what his hard hit rate was 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh but we did, and when you talk to organizations that you thought he might fit, it was what came up a lot, a uh, hard hit rate. And also, you know, 12 months earlier, he is non-tendered by a pretty well-run organization that had kind of seen him diminish. You obviously bring him back. Can you speak to us about uh, what you think of his ability to hit the ball hard consistently? And also, is he completely distanced from the player who had kind of fallen from NL MVP to something that the Dodgers look to get out of. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the honest answer is that we certainly hope so. I and mean, you think you never know completely. I think that was, that's just the, the nature of, of dealing with human beings on a daily basis, you know, but certainly the player we had last year was outstanding. Um, he did change his approach last year. Um, I think when you look at his hard hit rate and his, and his exit velos and stuff like that, pre two strikes and, with two strikes are pretty different. Um, and, you know, certainly he was able to get, he had so many big hits for us. He really battled with two strikes, put balls in play. I think you can see his strikeout rate. I think it was down to, you know, like like 16% or something like that last year, which is the, the lowest of his career. So I think he made real changes that led to some of the things you're talking about. But I mean, I think the market obviously um, with Cody, you know, you had this great young player with a, with a, the Dodgers and he had two years where he really struggled. It felt like the market sort of said like, Hey, we want to see a little bit more than just the, the one year. And I do think there were some, some statistical anomalies, I guess you could say that, that people wanted to see um, rectified. So uh, I think, like I said, I think the deal works out for both sides, you know, for uh, he gets a chance to try to go out and prove that those things um, shouldn't be a factor. And obviously we get a player that, that fits our lineup really well and, fits our team really well. Tell me about Steele. I mean, it seems like from my perspective, he came out of nowhere. He's your ace, your opening day starter or all-star. Um, did you anticipate this? I mean, he's not 22, 23. It's a little bit of a different story, but it's a very positive story. Yeah, the answer is no. I mean, certainly when we drafted him, you hope this is where he'd get, end up, but he has a long and winding road with Tommy John. And then he was in the bullpen for a while. And, I think our pitching guys did a great job with him. And one of the things they did is just realizing that he has a really tough fastball to hit. I mean, that's the simplest way to put it, that he's tough to barrel up. 
He's got his, his fastball cuts. It cuts differently all the time. And, you know, when he's at his best, it's a pretty simple two pitch, you know, two pitch attack plan. Occasionally he'll mix in a two seamer, like occasionally a change up, but really it's just, he's going at you with, you know, his fastball, which, which cuts and his, his slider. And like I said, he's just, he's hard to hit is the simplest way to put it. And um, to his credit, you know, after 22, we really challenged him like, Hey, let's, if you want to be the pitcher you think you can be, go to Arizona, work all off season, get in great shape. And he did that. He got himself in great shape. He looks great again this season. So um, I give him a lot of credit for the hard work, but I also think he's a guy a little bit, I would say it's a Joel, like a kind of a story of modernity, right? Like I think, Previously, that guy, that kind of guy would end up in the bullpen. They would have said, oh, you only have two pitches, but he's got a fastball that's really hard to hit. He can he can rely on his fastball far more than, than most guys can because batters don't really barrel it up. You know, Jed, uh, you mentioned this player's name earlier, and you had two of the most polarizing players in free agency this offseason, right? In Bellinger, you mentioned Marcus Stroman, that you needed to replace sure. him. You didn't bring him back. He ended up back in New York. Uh, for half a season last year, he was in Cy Young contention. Uh, then he didn't, uh, then he got hurt, then he got re injured uh, while hurt and didn't pitch well uh, when he did uh, kind of like pitch late la- last season. He has a, a bit of a spotty reputation in the industry and clearly had to clear things up with the Yankees and Brian Cashman uh, and found a home here. What, what, what are the Yankees getting in Marcus Stroman as both a pitcher and a person? Yeah, I mean, so last year it was interesting. When you look at the whole season in totality, he had a, a solid season. It was just, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball for two and a half months or so, and then he got hurt and really struggled when he came back. And, you know, to his credit, he rushed back to try to help us in a pennant race. I don't think it was entirely fair to judge him on the end of the season. He was a really good teammate for us. Um, you know, I think we gave him a lot of leeway to sort of be himself and to – to, to you know we we don't try to get guys to conform we try to let guys be themselves and he did a, a really good job of that and so now I've got nothing but good but good feelings about him um obviously he had a chance to opt out um that was in his contract and he, he exercised that and you know, we ended up going a different you know different direction with Imanaga but um I, I like Marcus a lot he's a he's a very good pitcher and you know when he's right and healthy it's a very confident guy with a great sinker if it was all of that, why didn't you work hard to bring him back? Well, actually, we did talk to Brody quite a bit about it. Um, you know, ultimately, like, you know, he had the one-year deal. We were completely great with him coming back. I actually thought it was a, a close call. He obviously made the right call when you look at like, when you look at it financially. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, I you know, had no issues with him whatsoever. And I, I, I wish him luck in New York. I think he, he likes a big stage. He likes – you know, you know, he, you know, like being a Met the first time through. So I think, I think he'll enjoy it there. You know, you mentioned Council earlier. Obviously, one of the best managers in the game. I, I want to get your theory on managing a little bit because obviously you, you paid quite a price for him, right? I, I mean, we know that Bruce Bochy makes somewhere around five million. He's now won four World Series. Uh, Council's obviously did a great job getting in the playoffs with a very small market team just about every year. So I don't doubt that he's a great manager. But how many wins is a manager worth? I, that's a great question, and we've studied that quite a bit. You know, to me, there's a stability that a good manager brings that is it's hard to calculate. You know that uh, the really great managers are never going to lose a clubhouse. Um, they're going to help in the building of the team. They're going to be more of a partner than just a than just managing the the game. So I think there's a stability that that there's a handful of guys in the game that I think can provide that, that provi- is tr- tremendously valuable. And I think that that's what Craig provides. I mean, he has, he thinks like a front office person. So he's going to be more involved in our team building stuff than a typical manager. But like I said, I think that just with his mind, with the way he, you know, interacts with players, I think there, like I said, there's a stability that, that, that creates, it's hard to calculate in like how many wins is it worth? But I think over, a five-year period, I think it's going to provide, you know, a um, just a foundation for the organization that is, you know, super beneficial. You know, Jed, you, to, to stick with counsel, you had to do a very uncomfortable thing to bring mm-hmm. in counsel, right? Involving David Ross, 
who had been besides a, a success, uh, you know, manager for you uh, had been a very successful player on a championship team. You know, the closest thing I can remember to it is the Mets acquiring Mike Piazza while Todd Hundley's hurt. And in some ways saying, well, if you get Mike Piazza, you get Mike Piazza and you figure out the Hundley thing later. And it feels a little bit like if you could get Greg Council, who you gave a manager record pay to five years at 40 million, you do it. Uh, was it worth it? Because again, you had to do an uncomfortable thing. And why, what are you seeing already that would make you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, I clearly wouldn't have done it if I didn't believe in it. You know, I think that, you know, time will tell. I think it's, you know, I think with a manager, I think it, it does take time for him to learn our personnel, to learn what's going on. I think, you know, judging him based on April or May or even 2024, I think is hard, but I think, like I said, you know, to John's question, I think over over this five year period, I think he's going to provide a tremendous foundation and and stability, and I think he'll will really benefit. Um, I really think highly of Rossi. I think he's going to get more opportunities to manage. I think he'll do a really good job. I think he did a good job with us. To me, it was just an opportunity to get a guy that I felt like was at the very top of of, of the game, and a guy that I felt like could be a really good partner. Um, for me and for our front office as we're looking to to build something here. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. You, you acquired Bush from the – I'm with the Dodgers, and I apologize yeah. for all the noise here. I'm in the suite, so I'm not supposed to be here. I should be apologizing to everybody behind me. But what, what are you expecting out, out of Bush and uh, your first base situation? Yeah, you know, we saw an opportunity there where, I mean um, – the Dodgers have sort of an embarrassment of riches at DH and first base. I mean, they got, you know, probably two first ballot hall of famers playing those two positions. And so, um, you know, for Bush, you know, I, I, he's moved around a little bit, but they didn't have, they were going to put Mookie at second and they were going to have, you know, Freddie at first and DH and Otani is it wasn't a lot of opportunity for him to play. And he's a guy that had sort of done everything that he needs to do in the minor leagues. His performance had been excellent. Obviously all of our, analytics on him as a left-handed bat were excellent. And, you know, we gave up, um, you know, a really good young pitcher in, in Jackson Ferris and a good young bat in Zaire Hope. But, you know, for us, it was, it was, a, you know, giving up those two young prospects, also getting, you know, six years of control of a guy, of a guy like Michael Bush that we think we can put right in the lineup right away. And he sort of fits with this other uh, wave of talent we have coming up, you know, with, you know, in terms of service time with, you know, guys like, Pete Armstrong and Owen Casey and hopefully Matt Shaw at some point and Chris Morrell. And so adding him to that mix, we felt like it really made a lot of sense for us to do that deal. Uh, you know, the guy who in theory is replacing Stroman in your rotation is Imanaga, uh, who uh, ended up being the other top level Japanese starter coming over. There was so much attention, obviously, play, pay, placed on Yamamoto and a pitching record uh, contract with the Dodgers. Uh, you've had him in your camp now for a few weeks. What what what, what do you have with Imanaga? Yeah, I mean he's he's fit in really well so far. He's really trying to learn English, which is which is wonderful, and he's he's got a great personality. Um, you know he's he's different than a guy like Yamamoto. I mean his what he does really well is he's got a, an excellent fastball, not in terms of eye popping velocity, but he's got real good ride and carry to his fastball and. Obviously, he struck out a, a ton of guys in Japan with that fastball. He's got a good mix. He's got a curveball, a slider. He's got, you know, he's, he has a, a fork ball. Um, he's been a really effective pitcher over there for a long time, and the hope is that he makes that transition well and that he can, you know, t you, you made the point of, like, you know, replacing Strom, and hopefully he can kind of be in our, you know, be in our rotation. He can continue to learn and, 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 and evolve and adapt, you know, you know, over here. And, it's not seamless. I, I watched it with Suzuki. I don't think I, think I don't think it's fair to expect a completely seamless trans, transition, but certainly he has the tool set and the intellect to want to to want to make that transition well, and I, I think he will. My final question: I wanted to ask you about uh, Otani and Yamamoto. I did some pursuing of these players. How much pursuing did you do? Did you feel you were ever close? I mean, I'm here in camp now. I just saw Yamamoto. I mean, he's never pitched. At all in the major leagues, yet everybody wanted him. So I'm going to assume that he must be great. The 380 yeah. million was uh, invested there. Uh, did you did you feel like you were a factor at some point for either of these two players? Yeah, I mean, I went. I, you know, we spent a lot of time scouting Imanaga and Yamamoto. I you know went over to see him last year. Um, oh, he's a terrific 
talent. I mean, he's 25 years old. He's got all the makings of, you know, a top of rotation starter, which is why he got the money he did. And he deserved it. Um, no, we weren't close on him. And then on, on Otani, um, and we were involved. I talked to Nez a lot uh, over the course of the winter. Um, at that level of financial commitment, we weren't involved. But, you know, certainly, I mean, he's probably the most talented player that's ever played the game. And obviously, you know, uh, who wouldn't want to be involved in talking to the agent about him? And I'm glad that we were a potential destination, but ultimately only one team could could wind up with him. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned a name that I'm curious about as I'm wrapping up here, Jed, earlier in Pete Crow Armstrong, uh, obviously has New York ties. He was the key, the piece for uh, Javier Baez when you trade him at the deadline. I think he got sent out a few days ago. You did bring Bellinger back, who can play center. You have Mike Tauchman, another guy with some New York ties on your team still to play center. What, what's the timeline for Crow Armstrong and what, what, what does he have to do to become your center fielder? No questions asked. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the benefits of bringing back Cody was the ability to give Pete more time. I think if we hadn't brought Cody back, there's a chance we would have just, you know, we end up going with Pete and letting him play center. Um, it, it's it's offensive. I think at this point, you know, defensively, he can play in the big leagues and have a massive impact, no question. I think from a base running standpoint, once he sort of like gets used to the big leagues, he'll have an impact on 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 base running. But I think offensively, this, you know, the consistency of approach offensively is what he needs to to go down and, and address. He he made real strides this winter. He worked with our hitting coach Dustin Kelly in Arizona all winter. His swing looks really good right now. I think he, there's really some positive signs. Just a matter of getting those reps in AAA. But I mean, yes, I, I would expect that he's going to impact the Cubs in in 2024 um, because the things he does, he does at a very high level. Uh, last thing, just to wrap up, uh, I, I find your division fascinating. Uh, you know, the Reds kind of took a step forward last year. They have a lot of interesting young players. The Cardinals took a big step back. They're trying, obviously, this year. The Pirates are, my words, I'm not going to put it in yours, in year 15 of a rebuild or whatever exactly it is going on there. Milwaukee is obviously going with a lot of talented young players, but, you know, no Burns, no Woodward, et cetera. Uh, and you you guys who, you know, you're re reinvested some money here this offseason. I think you're right near the top of the first luxury tax threshold number, maybe just a bit beneath it. Where do you fit in? What do you think of your division? Yeah, it really is a fascinating division. I think it will be for the next few years. I mean, I think by any by any service you want to use, you know, you have four teams that, you know, us and the, the Pirates and the Reds and the Brewers are all in the top five to seven farm systems in baseball and have a lot of young talent already there. And a couple of years ago, that was the Cardinals and a lot of those guys that have this graduated. So I think from a young talent standpoint, it, it may be one of the most talented divisions in, in baseball. So I know last year it was, you know, the Brewers kind of ran away from everyone. It was kind of a slog for the rest of the division, but I would expect over the next few years, the division is going to get better and better each year. I mean, I think that, all the teams are well run. They all have a lot of young talent. And I think that it's going to be a really competitive division that I think will just keep getting better and better as those guys go from rookie players or prospects into, you know, arbitration, those kind of things. So I, I think it'll get continue to get better and better. In my experience, most division stuff is cyclical other than probably the AL East, which doesn't seem like it has cycles. You know, it's always just a, a monster, but most most divisions are cyclical in the sense of like you'll have down periods for them and then they'll then they'll reemerge as teams rebuild and add their young talent. And I think that we had a sort of downturn in our division. I expect that um, it'll be really good over the next few years. Well, Jed, uh, obviously, a lot of that young talent is running around on the field right now down in Arizona for you. Uh, and it's a busy time of year. So we appreciate you finding some time to join uh, the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Uh, best of luck and thank you again. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Be well. We thank Jed Hoyer, of course, for joining us. Uh, John, uh, hit or error? You know, I'm going to give my error to the Giants. It's a little bit unfair because they're playing within the rules in, in uh, dropping J.D. Davis. I mean, they went to arbitration with them. They lost the arbitration. 
You want, once you a player goes to arbitration, it's a non-guaranteed contract, which is a real disincentive to go to arbitration and a major advantage uh, for management, for the teams. And, uh, you know, they, it was negotiated and it's been like this and uh, that's the way it is. But we don't see this happen very often. It, you know, it, while it's not uh, illegal and it's probably not even unethical, it's, it seems pretty rude to me. There's Rob J.D. Davis, you go to, you, you tender him a contract, you negotiate briefly with them, not a lot. They, they're kind of forced into a hearing. They go to the hearing, they win the hearing, and now, well, now they've signed Matt Chapman. I mean, someone's going to blame the agent and say, well, the agent should have known that the Giants could have signed Matt Chapman. Who knew? knows? Nobody knows. I'm reporting this every day. I don't know where Matt Chapman's going, so I don't blame the agent. And, you know, while there, there is really no grounds for a grievance here and uh, they didn't do anything illegal, I, I didn't think it was the right thing to do. Just dump J.D. Davis, and now he's a... A free agent late uh, when teams are at their budgets or at least whatever they're not spending and that's uh, put them in a bad spot. Yeah, you know, already a loophole for the C for the uh, union to close up in the next CBA negotiations three or four years from now. Uh, John, I think I did this as a hit when it was announced, but now that it's coming this week, uh, this weekend, I'd like to mention again the hit. I really do think this spring breakout is a really good idea, mid-spring training. Uh, I think the teams have generally embraced this by loading up the teams with all of their best prospects and not doing the thing like, oh, we want to not like overexpose our guys or have our pitchers throw too much. I think fans love next. Like the idea, like this time last year, think about how excited New York fans were about Alvarez and Volpe and getting to see them and hoping they make the team, et cetera. I think fans are always fascinated by that. And this weekend, we'll have a bunch of games with the best prospects uh, playing exclusively against each other, uh, complete games. I, I kind of love this idea for the sport. I'm with you. I think it's great. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, people want to Hope, that's what's so great about spring training to begin with. So the breakout, certainly more hope for fans, not only of the teams that win all the time, like the Dodgers, but all the other teams as well. So that's great. And I'm going to give you a hit for being so positive lately. So uh, um, you're Jeez, out of character, but uh, it's much appreciated. Well, now you've really put the pressure on me for next <laughs> week. Uh, John, we're getting, I mean, the, the games in Korea – are a, a little more than a week away as we're doing this. I think it's 20 and 21st. Those are the first two games of the year, the Dodgers and Padres, two weeks uh, to opening day. John, you know, we're, this is on YouTube, New York Post uh, Sports uh, site on YouTube. Please give it a look. I think it will uh, be up about uh, late Wednesday afternoon. And it will, if you see it, I always feel like we should explain there is a lot of kind of trying to like, Thread the needle here. John's in Arizona. I'm back in New York. I'm back in Florida tomorrow. And we've been bouncing around. John, John really worked at it this week to be able to do a show. It's very early in the morning when we're doing it. We did some of this yesterday. He's he's bouncing around and working. I wanted to mention how much I appreciate you being able to, to find the time nice. for it all. I mean, it's easy. The key is no sleep, which yeah, you know, I'd is. like to sleep. But, you know, some people just are not able to sleep. I don't have the yes. ability. Yes, I, I wish we both had that ability. I think we both fail at it. Uh, anyway, uh, you, I mentioned the YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, give us a five-star rating. It does help. Leave a comment. That helps as well. Uh, Jake Brown, Dan Shalom, thank you so much. They're our producers. They help us every week. And please stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayman.